All right, we're going to get started here. And so um, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, to present session 10 of the International IVF Initiative. Um, I am honored to and excited to be co-hosting this session with the International IVF Initiative with Eva Shankman with NIMES, the New York Metropolitan Embryology Society. For videos of previous sessions, you're welcome to go to IVFmeeting.com and you can find the previous and future presentations coming up. You will also find information about upcoming sessions on that page. Our continued goal is to support the IVF community during this COVID-19 pandemic by providing educational opportunities while bringing our community together. I've really enjoyed these sessions and a number of attendees from around the world participating has truly been remarkable. My name is Tony Anderson. I'll be moderating, the, moderating this session with Eva Shankman. We are co-sponsoring this event as representatives of two local embryology societies here in the United States. I am the founder of the South Texas Embryology Reproductive Technologist, or START, and Eva Shankman is with uh, NIMES, New York Metropolitan Embryology Society. I'd like to thank everyone for for joining today's session and are currently living and working around one of the hardest hit areas of COVID-19 in the world. We have a great program planned for you today titled Introduction to Quality Control Part 2. If you missed session one, you can go back into the previous meetings and, and find that there. Great presentation. <coughs> um, I encourage you all to ask questions using the question and answer section versus the uh, the, uh, the chat session. Please ask your questions in the question and answer session. International IVF Initiative has a talented team of panelists behind the scenes posting these questions and we'll be uh, answering most of these, many of these questions online today live. And any questions we don't get to, we will put into uh, on online answer with the, with the presentation. And at this time, I'll turn the program over to Eva Shankman who will begin our discussion. Hi, everyone. I have the uh, privilege today of introducing our two presenters. I'm going to introduce uh, both of them here at the beginning, and then we're going to start our presentation. Um, our first presenter, David Mortimer, is originally from the UK. He completed his bachelor's degree in zoology from Bristol and his PhD from Edinburgh. He completed postdocs in Edinburgh, Paris, and Birmingham. He is a faculty member at the University of Calgary and an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Dundee since 2017. He has given many invited lectures and taught workshops all over the world. He is the author or co-author of almost 300 conference presentations and 160 publications, including the book, Practical Laboratory Andrology, Quality and Risk Management in the IVF Laboratory, and a Practical Guide to Basic Laboratory Andrology. He has been a full-time consultant since 1999, and along with his wife, Sharon Mortimer, established the Vancouver-based International Reproductive Biomedicine Company, consulting company, Ozoa Biomedical, in 2000. He is currently serves as the scientific advisor to Mellowood Medical, Planer, Hamilton Thorne, as well as several art centers internationally. Elizabeth Hammond, who is going to be our second presenter, received a degree on embryo selection in 2017 from the University of Auckland. She holds a position as a research analyst and embryologist at Fertility Associates in New Zealand. And her research interests include embryo selection, reproductive gen genetics, and quality control in the IVF laboratory. So our first speaker, Dr. David Moore. So my presentation today is about indicators, KPIs, and benchmarking. We'll start with the usual uh, conflict of interest slide. Um, nothing commercial in regards to what I'm going to say, with the sole exception that some of the slides at the end have been provided by Melwood Medical in regard to uh, their new smart analytics platform. And that's clearly identified. So it's about 25 years ago since I gave what I believe to be the very first paper on the use of control charts in, in IVF labs. And that was at the World IVF Congress in Vienna in uh, 1995. And we concluded at that time that it was going to be a great way forward in, uh, in monitoring what was happening in the lab. And we've essentially used them ever since. So a, a key performance or KPI, this is ISO terminology. Uh, what key means is ever what you choose it to mean. So you decide what is key to you and it's entirely your decision. 
KPIs are essential for evaluating the introduction of a technique or a process, for monitoring the ongoing performance within a quality management system or QMS for both internal QC and external QA purposes. They're essential for benchmarking and for defining standards for proficiency or minimum standards for proficiency in some cases in terms of either clinic performance or even individual staff member competency. The KPIs are also essential in order to be able to do quality improvement because if you can't measure something, you can't see if you're doing any better. KPIs require precise definitions, including appropriate qualifiers and filters, things like patient age come to mind, and objective standardized methods, their determination in terms of both data analysis and the, uh, uh, sorry, the data collection and the analysis. We've employed the rule of three R's in terms of our indicators for many years. This is not uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is reliable, robust, and routine. A KPI must be reliable. It must measure something useful. So we need to measure something that we can define. So define the exact process you want to monitor and then minimize the extraneous effects so the KPI measures only the intended process. So what makes it robust is minimizing confounders to make sure you're measuring just what you think you're measuring. And the third R is for routine. And in this case, what we're saying is that data collection must not be arduous or involve a lot of extra work. Uh, if it does, then there's a risk of abandonment. Uh, if, if it takes a lot of extra work to do this stuff, then if you have a busier time or you've got a sh staff shortage due to a flu epidemic or something, um, it gets dropped and it's 10 times harder to start something back again once people have, have stopped doing it. So in this respect, KPIs and process control as a whole illustrates the crucial role of our information systems in the labs. The working, well, the basic principle is to work smarter, not harder. We can always find ways of doing more work, but the point here is to make it more as more as simple as possible, as automatic as possible, and so that it is useful to you without being a huge drain on your time. When you try to define a lab indicator or KPI, you need to define it fully. You need to define the process, whether it's biological, technical, administrative, or whatever, that you want to monitor. You need to obviously therefore have the endpoint of interest of that process, which is the KPI itself. You have to identify those qualifiers that are important to it. And in many cases, female age is important, for example, on pregnancy rates, implantation rates. Uh, we need to identify confounders. These are things that are extrinsic or outside the process of interest things that could affect the variability of what we're trying to measure uh, without being part of the process itself. So these essentially create noise in the system. So we've got biological factors. Uh, so for example, things related to abnormal stimulation response and fertilization age. They could be related to clinical practices, such as patient selection and fertilization rate. If, if all the patients who need ICSI are not getting ICSI, then your IVF fertilization rate would be adversely impacted. And it could be simple patient factors like source of sperm. If you're doing fertilization rate, you would relate it to probably ejaculated sperm and not include surgical sperm retrieval cases. You need to specify the data that you're going to collect. And one of the big things is how many cases are needed to collect the data from. And then how to derive the KPI from the data. That's your calculation formula. And then establish the appropriate periodicity for updating the indicator itself. So in large centers, it's easy to do these things monthly or every four weeks. It's not a problem. But in smaller centers, smaller numbers of cases leads to greater intrinsic variability of anything that you're measuring. So for smaller centers, you might consider a longer collection period based on a month, two months or whatever, or just doing it every fixed number of cases, every 30, 40, 50 cases, your choice. You might run a sliding window. In this case, it's not a way out of the lab. It means that you're, you might be calculating every two or every three months based on the last two or three months of data. So you have a result every month, but it's going to be based on two or three months of data. If you start smoothing um, like this, then it can cause issues. And that's illustrated in this graph, which is uh, purely as a price period uh, analysis taken from a, an, an Excel demo sheet. But the real information here on the monthly uh, data values is the blue line. And you can see it, it's jumping up and down. It's a sawtooth. And there's an indication it's going up. But month to month the, or period to period, the results are very variable. If you use an interval of two, so you took this value here as being the average of this month and the month before, or this 
value here, which is the interval value of this month and this month, you, you can see that you're going to smooth it and the red line is now not as a sawtooth. If you use the interval of four, then you obviously don't start getting data till later into the system uh, based on that absolute uh, smoothing interval. But you're now getting a smoother line. If you go to interval six, you get an even smoother line and that looks nice in terms of projecting what's happening to the price of something. But in terms of what's happening in your lab systems, it's hiding all the variability. So you have to get a balance between getting data that's more robust, less intrinsically variable, but having an update at a useful frequency. Process control charts or Schuhart charts. Um, Schuhart was the guy who invented the, uh, the use of these things. The core principles, they are based on your own historical data. And we usually recommend at least six periods of data are used to calculate the control mean and the sta its standard deviation. So this control mean here is based on six, at least six months preceding this period of information. So I'm, I've chosen this period for a particular reason. Uh, it's, it's not just to prove we we're doing it a long time ago. Um, but we've got here the control mean and we've got the warning limits, which is the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So that is the 95% range. And that's what you'd expect to stay within. The control limits, the red lines are mean plus or minus three standard deviations. And that's essentially the absolute limit of where things would be. That's the 99% range. So between the orange warning line and the red control line is an area where you're concerned it's outside the likely probability from your historical performance, but it's not yet completely ridiculous. The other thing, of course, is that you can't get above zero, uh, zero percent, so you can't get above 100 percent, you can't get below zero percent. So you will find that some of these limits will actually just subtend to the minimum or maximum possible value and it just stays there. We are not showing the uh, upper warning limit on this because it's not particularly important uh, in terms of triggering anything because we're only concerned about things going in the adverse direction. Two of the values shown here in the purple is one is competency and that's what any lab should be able to achieve. Um, that's usually defined by a consensus report or something like that. And that was the uh, for example, the Vienna consensus between Alpha and Eshra. And the benchmark, this is an aspirational goal. It's what the best labs achieve. If you're achieving it, that's great. Uh, perhaps you should look at setting a slightly higher benchmark for yourself in the future. So what we have here is the month by month values for this thing, which is the MB utilization rate in this case. Why I've chosen this period will become apparent in a moment. If you use the charts, to plot your results, but they also identify when you might have a problem. This is when your value for the, net, the latest period crosses the adverse warning limit or has just gone in the wrong direction for three consecutive periods. In these cases, you're saying this is uh, below the warning limit, it's below the 95% limit, so you expect that this is likely due to some extrinsic factor. And the three adverse shifts is basically the old concept of once it's happened, stands twice as coincidence, three times as enemy action. And so you're saying that you should have a look. It's, you, know, you wouldn't expect it to keep going in that adverse direction. You have a likely problem if your latest result crosses the adverse control limit. But a control chart can also identify when change has occurred. And in this case, it may be telling you that your control limits are no longer valid. And this is why I chose that period. So this is actually a zygote grade, uh, monthly average values, slightly statistically naughty to do that, but we, we do it because it's important to us. So we chose August 97 as the starting point for this graph because that was the month in which we introduced our new culture system at Sydney IVF in Australia. That was essentially the use of the mink incubators and our new sequential culture medium. And you can see by looking at these uh, data values over the next year or so, that we're very happy because the numbers are all being plotted essentially above the control mean of 17.15. And that looks very nice, but that's not the way these graphs should work. What this is telling us is that we've had a change because it should the results should be bouncing around the control mean. So 
since we made a systematic change at this point in August 97, it's suggesting that that was actually a systematic improvement. So if we now take these next first six months of the new period and calculate new control ranges from it, we end up with a graph that looks like this. So we only start from a later period after we've got the six months of data. But you can see that the res results now do bounce around the control mean. So the control mean is higher and the control ranges are actually narrower. So what this is telling us is we have, have had a systematic improvement. This is what you will see from control charts when you have such an improvement. The control mean goes up and the control ranges get narrower. So we've mentioned benchmarks, but benchmarking is a continuous process uh, way of measuring your performance. And it can be done in several ways. One is what's called in, internal benchmarking. This is where you do it over time, like a control chart, or between centers within a corporate group or corporate network. So if you're running half a dozen labs, you can compare your labs against themselves, against each other. Competitive benchmarking is, as it might suggest, against your competitors. Or you can look at the league tables that come from the US CDC or the UK HFEA and just see how you compare to everybody else. There's also the third concept, which is functional or generic benchmarking. This is where you're just comparing yourself against those that you see as national or world leaders or against established best practice standards for a defined system. And that's the example of the Vienna Consensus uh, benchmark values. But to do this properly, you may well need to have reference groups or subgroups in order to make the KPIs comparable across centers. But regardless of whatever you, what, you, what you're measuring or how you're doing it, benchmarking is all about the proof of the possible. If other people are getting those results, then that's a target for you to aim for. If they're doing it, why can't you? So essentially benchmarks are a special use of indicators. The question that is often asked is, is a benchmark value a minimum standard or an aspirational goal? Minimum standard, minimum performance value would define a criteria for the basic competency. So you could look at this, this and say, well, if you can't achieve at least this result, then you shouldn't be doing what you're doing or you, sh you should stop doing it or someone should stop you from doing it because you're not doing a good enough job. Benchmarks could also be aspirational goals. This is when we're using them as a best practice target. And this is what you'd like to achieve. Now, of course, those targets need to be realistic. We'd all like to get 100% pregnancy rates, but we know it's not realistic. So if anybody ever says they get 100% pregnancy rate, you first thing you know is they're lying or they're cheating in some way, taking N equals six cases or something. In reality, a benchmark could be either of these things, but when it's used for quality improvement purposes, it must be the latter. If we're going to use benchmarks, then we are deriving the benchmarks from appropriate population-based data, which means that we can only use that benchmark with similarly derived data. This is the reference groups coming to the fore, and it's not a question of comparing apples with apples. This is all about comparing Granny Smith apples with Granny Smith apples. The thing to remember is that benchmarks are not applied to individual patients. If a particular case has a result below some benchmark value, it is not considered to be abnormal or a failure. It's just what it was for that patient. But you might perhaps take the proportion of cases that fall below your benchmark value as another type of KPI. This would be like a, a negative KPI. You want to keep that number as small as possible. KPIs or control charts can also uh, help you identify and monitor systematic improvements. In this case, these are results from a clinic that we worked with for a number of years. And when a new medical director took over, he insisted on having systematic routine review of all treatment cycles by a multidisciplinary team. So the medical director, often another physician as well, usually the scientific director, which is me, uh, one or more embryologists as well, nurse or two, and even the pharmacist was involved in most cases. And in this case, every case, success or failure, was reviewed. The basic idea being to see if the stimulations were going right, if there were things we could do better, um, if a cycle had uh, a not very good response to the stimulation or was, was had a double step up or something, getting one egg, one em getting one embryo and transferring and getting a pregnancy is a, is a success for the patient, but it's not really how you want to see uh, the clinic functioning in the future. So 
during the period 2011 to 2013, every cycle was reviewed. And this graph shows the embryo development rate for day five. So this is blastocysts that developed on day five as a proportion of the zygotes. And it's for the second and third years. So you can see that there was a highly significant uh, correlation. The slope was absolutely not zero, which would be a horizontal line. And essentially we're going up by almost 1% per month. This is against the background of essentially the same clinical staff and protocols. The protocols were perhaps being applied better in terms of stimulation. And the lab protocols and staff were consistent throughout this entire period. So here we're clearly showing that there was a systematic improvement in the systems related to something else. And the something else here was not the lab. It was to do with people paying attention to stimulations, avoiding step ups and uh, starting higher doses, make sure follicles were recruited properly and, and whatever. You can use control charts for mon monitoring performance of equipment as well. In this case, I'm going to show you an example of cryotanks. Uh, I will say over the years, we've had three cryotanks that have, have been heading towards imminent failure. Um, the first one, I admit, was picked up uh, more or less by accident by just people just commenting. Um, but that very quickly made us aware of these things. And uh, since the mid 80s, we've uh, monitored cryotanks very carefully. And it's very simple with these small tanks, the procedure is to use the dipstick and measure the remaining liquid nitrogen level in the tank before a regular weekly top up. You need to fill your tanks on a regular basis like for this sort of measurement and you can't do it every, every couple of days because the difference is not measurable or robustly measurable. Tanks have a static holding time measured in weeks, many weeks. And if you fill up once a week, you are not increasing the risk of, of anything. And then you record the data for the cryotank. Now, having got this table of numbers, you don't see any pattern from these numbers. But if you plot them on a control chart, you very quickly can see that the control range is here and week by week, the tank is remaining as you'd expect it to be. Um, I've shown a digression here where it was gone, it went below the control limit and that was explainable and we were expecting it because somebody had to go searching for a straw they dropped into the bottom of the tank. And so there was more activity in the tank and more nitrogen evaporated during that. We're in this tank, which I will admit is a fictitious tank. Um, if the data showed downward trends consistently, in this case, it may or may not be related to a problem, but once it cross, crosses the warning level, you start to worry. And you should seriously think about moving your specimens into your spare tank which of course you should always have and kept cold, but not full of liquid nitrogen because it's full, there's nowhere to move the specimens into. And uh, in this case, the tank is monitored further and you can see at this point here, we are now absolutely outside our expected range and you really do need to move the specimens uh, to avoid the risk of uh, a specimen loss. Uh, so we've almost lost three tanks, we've never lost a specimen. People also ask me how many indicators you need and this is a minimal set that we use, well, still use in uh, many places. This is what we consider to be a, a useful way of monitoring our systems. We keep the IVF and ICSI cases separate up until cleavage rate. And we do that because ICSI zygotes are more sensitive to show things than IVF zygotes because the ICSI eggs were exposed to the lab environment for a significant period of time during the ICSI procedure, whereas the IVF eggs aren't. But from the zygote cleave, uh, stage onwards, uh, from, uh, from cleavage, we then start looking at all embryos in the lab together. And we do include things that relate to clinic performance in terms of pregnancy tests, implantation rate per embryo transfer, clinical pregnancy rate. Um, these obviously include some measurements and endpoints that are outside the lab's control, but they do give us a very good way of looking at an, an overview of what's going on. The second alpha consensus meeting uh, was about competence and benchmark values for cryopreservation. This was done at a time when vitrification was uh, a fairly new thing and people were wanting to know what they should expect as performance and people were saying that their other people's slow freezing results were terrible and look at comparisons. So we had the mean to try and decide on what would be the minimum expectation and the aspirational benchmark values for cryopreservation of oocytes, zygotes, 
cleavage stage embryos and blastocysts, whether using slow freezing or vitrification. It took another number of years before we managed to get a meeting together, and this was done joint with, with ESHRA, the Embryology uh, Special Interest Group of ESHRA, on looking at a series of KPIs for fresh IVF and ICSI cycles. In this case, the, the, uh, the group compiles a list of uh, performance, or minimum performance competency levels and aspirational benchmark values as appropriate for what was considered a minimal set of 19 indicators. In this case, they weren't all considered to be KPIs because some people thought that KPI was not the appropriate term for some of these things, and I'll explain that now. So the first thing we, we had was what we call reference indicators, and these are things that are not under the lab's control. These really describe your incoming raw material, proportion of M2 or sites at ICSI. When you, after you strip them, you can see how many are M2s. Uh, in terms of how many eggs you're getting, uh, a lot of labs or clinics do look at the number of eggs that they get uh, compared to the number of follicles that were measured on the day of trigger. Now, that can exceed 100%. And if it's at or over 100%, what it's telling you is that there are a lot of small follicles that are being aspirated. And therefore, you would be expecting a lower percentage of M2s, perhaps, and you may well discover that that value is also variable depending on the physician who's doing the retrievals. So this is about your raw material. Performance indicators are things that the group uh, felt were things that you should have the data for but not necessarily monitor on a regular basis. That was a consensus meeting. This is what the group agree, uh, agreed on as a whole. Personally, I would consider all these to be KPIs and we would track them anyway, but we are perhaps a little bit more obsessive than, than other people. And some of these things don't actually have a competency and benchmark value, they just have a, uh, a low value, which is what you want to stay below, because these are sort of negative measurements. You might be surprised that good blastus development is on this list, and that was because at the time this meeting was done, there were still a lot of places that were just, are just not doing routine day five transfers. And hence there was a, a feeling that we shouldn't make this a key indicator. We have been doing uh, day five transfers for many, many years now. So list of KPIs is a fairly uh, standard sort of rate, uh, sorry, uh, set, and failed fertilization rate is here, again, with just a, a threshold you want to stay below. We did update the blastus cross survival rate because by the time this meeting was held, uh, essentially everybody was doing vitrification of, of blastus and the, the values were significantly different in terms of our expectations compared to what they had been uh, when the original uh, cryo KPIs consensus was held. So you can find these published in uh, RBM online and in uh, Human Reproduction Open. When you're trying to get these reports, it's really good if these things will come out of your database and not have to be compiled by hand into an Excel spreadsheet from your paper records or from other aspects of your database. And the system we've worked with many, for many years now is the uh, IDEA system from Melwood Medical. And this is their KPIs report. Uh, it says advanced because this is actually a much larger set than the basic Vienna consensus. And you can see that this report, which is based on crystal reports, uh, you will get these graphs. This is a fertilization rate graph. And you'll see there are control mean and, and ranges on it, you need to pre-configure those values yourself and then it will plot them for you. The report itself is run by the user as and when you want to run it and the report is generated by many SQL queries of the database. So all you do is set the date range for the report. But when you run the report it gives you a printout and that means the results are now static. Deeper analysis requires data export and data mining with external stats packages or whatever. But this report shows you the overall FERT rate. It splits it down into IVF and ICSI. And down below is a table showing the actual numbers that were involved in the, uh, creating these graphs uh, so in case you want to do something else with them. Now this, as I said, once you've done it, is static. The future is all about trying to get more business intelligence, going towards artificial intelligence, and your database sits somewhere below that. And it's not just your database, there may be data that are built up from raw data in the database, there may be 
external data that is important. And then there's all sorts of other things you might want to tie in here, like Google Analytics or, or whatever. This smart system, it's an analytics platform. It's web-based. It's mobile device friendly. It's real-time analysis and data mining. So when you run this, it shows it for the time period you're looking at, but it's live. You can not just look at your database, the medical database information, you can also integrate data from other sources. And this allows you to eliminate what are called data silos. So for example, you may take information from your continuous lab equipment monitoring system. And we, we often use uh, things like uh, planar uh, data shore. And you, that information stays in a separate database to your medical records. So it's not part of the patient's medical record. So it could never, would never be accessed by a subpoena for a patient's medical record, for example. But it's linked. If you have the links in your medical record to certain equipment, you can find out what the equipment performance was and you can query the two things together, although the data are not merged. So this system creates a whole bunch of dashboards for all different aspects, corporate analytics, operational ones, business, financial administration, surgical services, clinical outcome stats, and a lab services one. So dashboard is simply this sort of presentation where you've got a bunch of, uh, of uh, filters or criteria with which you set your system to function, and then you have a whole bunch of graphs and figures that are here. Now, this one is a clinic operations dashboard where we're interested in appointments, first appointments, progression to treatment, etc. This is the uh, lab dash the dashboard for the vienna consensus lab kpis the presentation looks a little bit different at this stage because it's trying to summarize all of your basic kpis on one screen the filters are only by year and month at this uh, on this particular screen and the kpis are grouped by the day of cycle in the lab there are color co color codes around these boxes as well the dashboard tiles themselves are color coded for immediate interpretation. If it's got a green border, then the value is okay. And it's because it's between the warning limits. If it's outside your control range, it's a red border, it's thumbs down. If it's in between blue border, uh, it's between the warning and control limits, you need to probably investigate. As I said, the tiles are grouped by culture day and you can click on the tile to see more detail. And there are, many, many filters available that can be applied or you know, selected, deselected, alone or in combination in real time as you apply them, the system will recalculate all the values it's displaying for that new configuration. All of the graphs can be exported for using other documents and reports. And there is an advanced dashboard under development that will cover the whole of the Vienna consensus plus many more matching up to that initial advanced uh, report that you saw at the beginning of the uh, discussion on these uh, uh, crystal reports. If you explore the fertilization rate further, we've now got some very uh, simple filters to apply, your clinic sites, a visit by physician, by lab operator, treatment types, diagnosis, whatever. And here we can just see the things that relate to the beginning of the treatment. So here we've got sperm motility post prep, it's below the Vienna consensus competency level, which is 90%, and therefore it's considered to be a problem. We've got our polyspermia rate, 1PN rates, um, and we've got our fertilization rate graph here. If we click on that fertilization rate graph, we go down further, we get the same graph with the data as you had the printed report, and we've got those same filters as we had before, here and here, but now we have a whole stack, and there's many, many more going off way down the screen, of other filters we can apply to investigate this further in real time. We can choose it, select them, deselect them, and see what it does to the results. Results being the number of eggs inseminated in the orange columns, and then the, the dark blue uh, purplish line is the actual fertilization rate value month by month. If you click that graph one more time, you would now get down to your control chart, which would show the, the limits more obviously and include competency and benchmark levels if you had entered them into the system. It will only show these things if you have actually put them into the system because it's your choice what they are. 
and you can still then apply all the filters as you wish to. So this is a very big data exploration tool. So take home messages, uh, routine KPIs are essential for effective internal QC and troubleshooting. KPI control charts and benchmarking are now core elements of a lab's quality management system. And I think you, you, you really have to have them if you want to have any chance not of knowing what's happening in your lab. And without these, you can't actually troubleshoot. So they're really important. There are now published competency levels and benchmarks for general use within, within and between IVF labs. You may need to be using the same defined reference groups for com comparisons, but they are there as far as the Vienna consensus goes. Expectations for performance or outcomes are widely discussed around the industry, but they're rarely available as center-specific values, making it very difficult to establish what we might think is minimum performance criteria for the whole industry. So you can, see, as I said, for CDC or HFEA, you can see individual clinic results, but in many other places, you don't know who the results relate to, and you don't know about their patient makeup. So reference groups can get you past that. But the other problem is that in many situations, clinics seem to be happy if they're just achieving the national average. And I'm not happy with that because that really means that we're, said we're heading towards um, uh, national mediocrity, if you like. If everybody's sitting around the national average and not trying harder, then the whole country is gonna be sitting with a, a perception of this is what you should be achieving those aspirational goal benchmarks are really important for driving people, for making them want to do better. Quality improvement is key. Finally, the, the use of analytics and integrating between your electronic medical record databases and other clinic and lab data, for example, real-time equipment monitoring systems, or even it's only just your daily um, check sheet um, measurements of equipment that you've done on paper and put into Excel or you've done using one of the various apps that are around there. This integration is a way forward and the ability to explore it using an, um, an analytics platform is important. As I said before, work smarter, not harder. Simple rules, no piece of information should have to be entered into a, a database or a system more than once. It should be accessible from wherever you put it. And as we move into the future, real-time data entry and automated data collection, wherever it's possible, are what we should be aiming for. Thank you very much. Well, they are much more informative in terms of how you do this on troubleshooting, but you basically look at everything. Okay, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, we should probably, Dr. Hammond, we should probably move on to your presentation. David, if you can just stop sharing your screen. And Dr. Hammond, if you can share your screen. And we'll have time for, we have a lot more questions. We'll have time for those at, at the end. Okay. <clears throat> hi, um, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the International IVF Initiative for giving me the opportunity to uh, present today. So today I'm going to be talking in more detail um, to the Vienna KPI consensus. Um, and I'm also gonna be providing um, a real world example of KPI tracking, um, which we published last year. And this is the KPIs in action. So embryology key performance indicators tell us about embryo development rates of those embryos being cultured in our lab. For example, their fertilization rates, their usable blastus rates, and also their pregnancy rates down the line. In essence, they tell us uh, how the lab is interacting with the embryos, um, which asks the question, is the lab um, actually supporting successful embryo development? Of course, we know that embryology KPIs are also influenced uh, by patient factors and the quality of those gametes that are coming into the lab. 
Embryology KPIs and tracking these are an important part of quality management within the lab. Um, and they are also used for benchmarking as David has covered in his presentation. So um, again, the idea of benchmarking is to compare uh, to industry standards, um, which enable you to compare how well your lab is doing um, and enable you to assess whether your rates are optimal. And of course, the ultimate goal of all of this is to ensure uh, culture safety and quality of care in the lab. So when we track embryology KPIs from month to month, for example, the IVF fertilization rate, in theory, we might, we might pick up shifts in development or optimal conditions that have occurred. Um, so this could be in response to process changes, use of adverse consumables, um, or even operator effects, which would be more in the case of ICSI. The goal of systematically tracking KPIs is to, um, again, in theory, aim for rapid detection when something is off. So the more quickly you can detect a shift, the sooner you could get onto troubleshooting that shift um, and determining what is actually causing that um, and whether it could be remedied. So how should your lab go about tracking laboratory KPIs effectively? Um, so David's provided some um, really good information um, on uh, this topic. And I just want to focus here on uh, one particular document, which is the Vienna KPI consensus. And so this Vienna consensus provides a framework for KPI tracking. And it was published in 2017 by the ESHRA Special Interest Group of embryology and alpha scientists in reproductive medicine. So this was published um, jointly by HR Open and also RBM Online. So this Vienna consensus came about because it was identified that there was a gap in KPI publications. Um, so this is an important aspect of embryology, yet there have not been um, very many academic publications on the topic. And uh, the Vienna consensus was based on data which came from a survey on KPIs, which was taken by an international expert panel. And their, work, their goal was to establish a KPI framework to use specifically for fresh IVF and ICSI cycles. Um, and they defined these KPIs in a lot of detail, um, including their and included their calculations. So what they also did, uh, which was really useful, was to provide a reference value for where each KPI rate should be. So they provided the minimum rates, which is the competency rates, and then the benchmark rates, uh, which is also referred to as the aspirational goal. And in between this is what they call the desirable range of each KPI. Um, and so essentially these numbers and these rates provide where each KPI should be falling um, within your lab. So they're incredibly useful reference values to use um, as you're troubleshooting your own data. More specifically, they name three types of indicators. The reference indicators were more about those oocytes coming into the lab, um, and they reference here ovarian stimulation effects that could be occurring. So for example, uh, one reference indicator would be the oocyte recovery rate. Next, the performance indicators are those uh, which are um, important, but they don't necessarily require continuous tracking. So each lab should be keeping a record of what these are um, and know the rates within their lab, um, but they don't necessarily need to be tracked um, on a monthly basis. So for example, um, the IVF 3PN rate um, could fall uh, into this category if it was relatively stable. So next is the key performance indicators or the KPIs. Um, and these are the core indicators of the IVF lab. Um, and these are the ones that should be tracked, uh, tracked on a regular basis. For example, um, the rates of blastocyst development. 
So this is a list of the 12 key performance indicators or KPIs, um, so those core indicators, um, and their calculations from the Vienna Consensus. So as you can see, these KPIs range from uh, fertilization rates uh, all the way to implantation rates. Um, and uh, there are a number of different types of KPIs there. And the use of these could be catered according to aspects of embryo culture unique to each laboratory. So for example, the proportion of IVF and ICSI cycles, um, whether day two or day three checks were being done, proportion of cleavage stage transfer versus blastocyst um, stage transfer. So I'm not going to go over each KPI in detail, and instead you can uh, turn to the consensus document directly for this information. But one thing I will draw your attention to is the blastocyst development uh, rate KPI, which is um, about halfway down the table. So this is the number of uh, blastocysts on day five over the number of embryos. Um, and that's regardless of blastocyst quality here. So we're gonna focus a bit more on this um, in our paper in the next few slides, um, where we instead focused on the day five usable blastocyst rate. So those blastocysts that were transferred or frozen, and this does take into account um, blastocyst quality. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. So the Vienna consensus had some further recommendations for how we um, track these KPIs in the lab. Um, and for KPIs, they recommended tracking at least on a monthly basis, although this is going to uh, depend quite heavily on your caseload. So as a minimum, it was recommended to have at least 30 cases per data point when calculating KPI rates. And that's just to ensure that the data is meaningful um, and to minimize any skew that's happening in the data from few cases. And so it was also recommended that some KPIs could be separated by subgroups. Um, and for example, for pregnancy rates, we use uh, a divide by age, 37 years and younger versus 38 years and older, um, reflecting uh, the different aneuploid and your plotty proportions in the populations of embryos. So we have this Vienna consensus, which provides a really practical guide on the IVF um, and ICSI KPI framework for fresh cycles, um, but it is based on expert opinion. And there are limited academic papers on the topic, which give examples of large KPI data sets. And so more um, work needs to be done in this area. In 2019, we published a paper which studied real-world KPI performance, and this was with my co-author, Dean Morbeck. So we wanted to provide example of how embryology KPIs can be used to detect shifts in culture. And in our case, we tracked KPIs during a time when we had shifted culture media. So there was this control change in the lab um, that we could study over this period. So this came about because we decided to change culture media in 2016, following a sibling oocyte study. So we had looked at our uh, total usable blastocyst rates following this initial validation, which was stable. And so we um, went on and switched media. During this time, work, though, we then had concerns about the media's performance um, in our own labs. So we did end up switching back to our original culture media. And what we were left with then was three phases of culture, each with a duration of five months. So for the paper, we performed a retrospective analysis of KPIs during this time to demonstrate how they behaved. Um, and we had a particular focus on the blastocyst, usable blastocyst rate KPIs um, following this lab change. So for each KPI, we used control chart tracking, uh, tracking as outlined by David in the previous talks. So I will take you through each KPI you, um, during the study period using these control charts. Um, and for our control limits, um, which are the red lines there, 
we use the previous six months worth of data. Um, and on these graphs, which I'm about to show you, I've just um, showed the adverse or lower control limits here, which identify unexpected low rates. Um, also on the side, I've got reference to the Vienna competency and benchmark values, so where this KPI should be falling according to the Vienna consensus. So um, here we have the IVF fertilization rate by month for the study period. Um, so this is June 2016 to August 2017. Um, and these track along nicely compared to the Vienna consensus uh, competency rates, uh, with the exception of December 2016 there, which was low. Um, and on further investigation, uh, this was a low volume month for us where we had um, a low number of IVF cases. Um, and so when you do have a low number of cases like that, that can skew your rates. Um, basically, the more cases, the better for being statistically robust. Next, we have the ICSI fertilization rate. Um, and again, this tracks along stably during the study period um, and falls nicely within the Vienna consensus uh, values. Then we look at our total usable blastus rate. So this is calculated as the number of blastocysts transferred or frozen on day five, six or seven over the number of embryos. Um, during this study period and when we switched culture media, there was actually no change in the total usable blastocyst rate. Um, and this is the KPI that we um, had relied on primarily when changing culture media. And nothing was off about the total number of blastocysts being used per cycle. Um, and hence we continued with that culture media. A note here about the Vienna reference values for this um, KPI. There are actually none given for this KPI because it is going to differ from lab to lab according to your minimal threshold for blastocyst utilization. Um, here during this period um, on this graph, we have an average total usable blastocyst rate of around 40%. Um, now, this data did have some exclusions, for example, um, donor egg cycles. And so over time, and since 2017, we typically see total usable blastocyst rates um, in our total treatment population of around 50%. So we saw no change in the total number of blastocysts that were being used. Um, but what about when you only focus on those day five blastocysts? So this is a graph of the day five usable blastocyst rate calculated as the number of blastocysts either transferred or frozen only on day five over the number of embryos. What you can see on this graph is actually a five month shift in the day five usable blastocyst rate where the rate falls below either the control line or the warning line, which is the dotted line. So in other words, the same number of blastocysts were developing, but they were developing um, more slowly. And so I'm going to show you how the culture media change maps to the shift on the next slide. Um, but first, I just want to point out here um, that the usable day five blastocyst rate, or what was called the good quality day five blastocyst rate, was actually limited to being a performance indicator in the Vienna KPI consensus rather than one of those core KPIs that required regular tracking. Um, so instead, the KPI provided by the Vienna consensus was a day five um, blastocyst development rate, um, but it, this didn't reference quality. So um, there's just a difference there between the Vienna consensus and uh, the KPI that we use in the paper. So when we match the culture media um, period to the day five shift, we can see that the two periods coincide. Um, and this makes sense. Uh, with a change in culture conditions, you may get a shift in developmental rates. Um, and here we were seeing slower blastocyst development um, compared to our original uh, culture media, which uh, reflects different culture conditions. So how um, does this change link to pregnancy rates? So for this group of patients, we had a proportion of cycles undergoing fresh day five transfer. Having slower blastocyst growth by day five may actually make it more difficult to select which embryo to transfer out of the cohort um, if they're less expanded at the time of grading. 
What we did see was a lower clinical pregnancy rate for two months, which also coincided with the change in culture media. So it's possible that this could have been linked to suboptimal day five last assist selection at fresh transfer during this time. And just a note on the clinical uh, pregnancy rate KPI in general, um, this is a clinical KPI um, and this tends to be quite an up and down KPI because it is heavily influenced by patient demographics, most importantly female age. And you can see that here reflected in the graph um, because you can see that the KPI is quite up and down, um, but you can also see that represented in the wide control limits um, on the graph, which means that historically um, this KPI is up and down. So what we gained from our paper is that the day five usable glasses rate is an important KPI that had the ability to detect shifts in culture and can link to pregnancy rates in some cases. So had we been tracking the day five usable blastus rate from the beginning, we would have detected our shift in culture earlier and switched back. So what we recommend is that this um, KPI be treated, that this be treated as a KPI, um, i.e. as part of the core KPI tracking of the lab. And since this time, we now track the day five usable blastus rate at all of our sites every two weeks. Um, and for us, it contributes to our core KPIs. So there are some more examples of where we have used the day five usable blastus rate to detect potential shifts in culture. Um, and this graph is from one of our, at one of our sites showing their day five usable blastus rate from 2016 to 2020. Um, in contrast to the previous uh, graphs from the study, this graph includes all cycles, including those using donor eggs. Uh, donor eggs. Um, and so that's reflected in the control limits. Um, these are a bit higher for this population than for the study. What you can see here is the original shift in the day five usable blastus rate um, that was related to the media transition in 2016. Um, and then you can see that um, KPI goes back up um, once we switch culture medias. But towards the end of 2018, though, um, this clinic alone um, had, a, had three months out of a five month period that had day five usable blastus rates below either the warning or control limits. Um, and at this time, there were no changes in the lab um, and the shift was only detected at one of our sites. Um, and we don't know for sure, but our leading hypothesis for this um, shift uh, is that it could have been related to some building works that were occurring not in the laboratory, but in the vicinity. Um, and potentially that could have had an effect on um, air quality um, and, and also could explain why the shift was only detected at one site. Um, when we looked at cumulative um, pregnancy rates um, prior, uh, compared to the previous five months, um, we didn't see a statistically significant difference in pregnancy rates. Then in June of 2019, there was quite a large drop to 25% um, in the day five usable blastus rate, uh, which did set off alarm bells for us. But this did go up the very next month um, and did appear to be an isolated event. So we're still analyzing um, this change from last year, but there was no change in the lab again. So this uh, demonstrates that you might not always have an explanation for these types of shifts, and also they might not necessarily coincide with shifts in pregnancy rates. Um, but for us, they still make up a core component of our regular KPI tracking. Um, it's a very useful KPI, um, and we investigate these shifts when they drop um, across a large number of cycles. So these are just some more, um, more general notes about how we use the usable blastocyst rate KPIs. So we only use cycles that have one or more fertilized eggs, um, and we do exclude cycles that have cleavage stage transfer, because we don't know whether the transferred embryo uh, makes a blastocyst. So we track, um, these usable blast uh, KPIs every two weeks, but we do cite the minimum of 30 cases from the Vienna consensus um, when doing our analysis if we find that something's off. And what I'd recommend is that sites that don't do much blastocyst culture could instead 
instead substitute these usable blastocyst rate KPIs with um, a good day three development rate instead. And the Vienna consensus does provide some more information on this. So I hope that I've provided um, some practical information to turn to for embryology um, KPI tracking, um, and especially those blastocyst rate KPI, uh, usable blastocyst rate KPIs. So I do urge you to become familiar with the Vienna consensus as a practical guide on this topic. Um, and these are the references to the Vienna consensus itself and also our paper. So thank you everyone for listening. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. We had two great uh, presentations. Um, I do want to jump right into questions. We have quite a few questions, and I want to see if we can get as many answered as possible live. Um, so, Dr. Hammond, should uh, this question from Sil uh, Salel, I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly, should it be more effective if KPIs rearranged based on patient groups? For example, in my lab, most of the patients, um, up to 70% are poor responders. Um, are all these KPIs valid for that group? Um, so when we track uh, KPIs, um, the, the only division that we do um, routinely um, is the division by age. So that's a really important one um, for pregnancy rates, uh, for um, better HCG estimated pregnancy rates and clinical pregnancy rates. Um, so the rest of them, we would then do subgroup analysis if we found that something was off. We would then delve into that analysis and look at the different types of patients. Um, if you're talking about poor responders, um, that could mean a, a low number of eggs, um, which potentially might make your fertilization rate KPI a bit up and down. Um, so I think David mentioned that as well. You could um, cut off with a minimum number of eggs uh, if you got skewed. At skewed or do that on a by egg uh, rate calculation. So add the total number of eggs and then the total fertilization rate um, and do a division instead of on a case by case basis. Yeah, great, great presentations from both of you guys. Um, um, Dr. Mortimer, I have, um, I love how the, the EMR is a great resource or we've learned a lot in these I3 initiative talks that there's a lot of peripherals we can use to help us out and our EMR is, is really a key and as I mean I've actually used ideas in a multiple multiple databases um, and have found that you know trash in is trash out have you ever discovered that some of your lulls in your quality management reports are not so much problems in the lab but really data entry errors human errors Sadly, GIGO is a, uh, a basis of anything to do with analytics. It's garbage in, garbage out. If your data quality is not good, it'll be there. Um, Research-wise, we always used to make people enter the, all the data twice. You can't get embryologists to do that. Um, you just have to be very careful in your data, and uh, ideally, you should actually audit a certain percentage of your data entry for accuracy on a regular basis. If you see any a massive shift on something or a, a real outlier, then the first thing you do is go back and check the data, of course. It, it is possible that uh, someone put in a wrong number, but m most database functions that I, I've been aware of will actually keep track of, of things where you've put an extra zero on the number of eggs, for example, so your third rate's only a tenth of where it should be. Um, but um, you just have to be careful. I mean, if you don't take care of the data, then you'll, you'll never get good information from it. That's true, very true. I was going to ask you, Dr. Dr. Hammond, um, sorry, Eva. No, nope, um, nope, continue. I, I saw a very similar uh, trend in my lab one time where, like, I look at, do you guys do a lot of PGT in your lab? Um, we do some, um, but m most embryo transfers would not be tested. My, yeah, fresh trend. We do a lot of PGT in our, in our labs, uh, and... Um, so I'm always looking at the ratio of day five, day six. Historically, it's usually around a 50-50. I don't know how that compares to other people in the audience, but I started seeing a shift very similar to what you guys saw in the day five usable blasts. And without changing anything, I just brought it up to my lab team 
and and then instantly the shift kind of went back. So I kind of I kind of put that on the fact that maybe a lot of our blast assist biopsies were on weekends, and you know was, let's just wait till Monday to do that. Or I don't really know, but after I you, I pointed that out, I saw the shift, and I'm just curious if you thought maybe. Have, did you ever look at just not changing anything? Because unless you change the media at that point, but in the next downshift, it was during a, uh, it was during the same media, the period three, you saw another lull in there. Like, would that have anything to do with just, you know, human, you know, path of least resistance, so to speak? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we did look at the rate of um, PGS on those three periods, which were similar. Um, and I agree, I think the proportion of, um, it, of PGS testing can really influence this day five usable blast this rate. Um, and I also uh, think that could be how you do your biopsy. So if you're um, hatching at day three and then waiting for those embryos to hatch out, um, they may need some extra time to be at that stage. Um, and so we definitely see some slight shifts with um, you know, maybe a higher proportion actually being used um, on day six in those cases. Um, in terms of the lull uh, you're talking about, um, uh, it did take a while for those rates to come back up. Um, they weren't, so once we switched culture media, they were above the control limits, which is the important thing. Um, but we also saw that with the pregnancy rates as well. Um, that there was a bit of a lull, uh, a little bit of a hangover from that potentially. Um, we don't know why that is, um, but we do know that that KPI is uh, quite up and down. You may well want to separate, if you're doing a lot of PGT, you may want to separate your PGT and non-PGT cycles into different, da in different data sets for looking at KPIs. So I mean, it may not be comp directly comparable. Yeah, so I mean, we would expect that our total usable blastus rates would be quite similar across the two, but yeah, the day five, the speed could really um, have an impact. Um, but yeah, for us, um, the proportion seems to be quite stable across different time periods. One of the things that we found on, on troubleshooting visits that gives some of the biggest downstream impacts is whether the uh, physicians are respecting the trigger date. Uh, if you, I've seen places with up to 70% of cycles triggered one, two, or even three days later than the official trigger criteria. And this obviously leads to increased numbers of post-mature oocytes, which have often got quite good abil developed ability for the first few days, but they certainly seem to increase the early pregnancy loss rate and the overall uh, clinical pregnancy rate. So uh, it, one of the first things we look at for any troubleshooting visit is uh, ordering a whole bunch of cycles and just see what the physicians are doing with their, their trigger dates because uh, one of the things you also see then is that the number of M, proportion of M2 oocytes will go up and they, I've seen it in the high 90s of percent and that's uh, a, a good relationship with increased post maturity as well. Thank you. Um, David, quick question for you. Do you think that um, our difficult cases, our TESA, our severe male factor patients, um, that those kind of cases should be removed for KPI calculation? It depends on what, which calculation. I, I, I've said, I said in one of my early slides that uh, you may, in terms of uh, patient tag, you may well separate it out by sperm source. So yes, if you would not be looking at your, your foot rate uh, using SSR cases included with your fresh semen cases, um, you would probably for your KPI look at the results in either separate groups, you have a large number of SSR cases, or just simply exclude them from calculating the, the ICSI FERT rate. It's, it, it's not fudging the data, it's giving you something to measure your overall performance. And you know, you're trying to create, reduce the variability of the KPI measurement so that it becomes more sensitive to reveal changes to you. If it's going to be more variable because you've got variable but modest proportions of SSR cases, then it'll just become more variable. You'll have wider control ranges. So everything seems to still stay within the control range. You want to work to get those control ranges relatively narrow, uh, giving you the sensitivity to being aware that things might be changing. So yes, you, you, you define those things as you wish. 
that clearly your your IVF birth rate is going to be defined on on IVF cases, and your ICSIs on ICSI cases, and you may well choose to exclude SSR cases from that. Now, for for medium or small size programs um, that are looking at data monthly, I think Dr. Hammond touched on it in her lecture. But what do you think is the minimum cycle volume per month that'll make KPIs um, meaningful, or should they move to quarterly? Yes. So. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lily. Um, so with our um, smaller clinics, we still do track those KPIs every two weeks. So we just do it with all clinics combined, just to have a look. Um, and it, those will be more up and down because of the sample sizes. Um, so when we would go to investigate that, we would just look at the number of cases, anything under 30. I like having that really clear guideline. Um, of 30 cases, um, and so I will take that into consideration when I see those. Um, but definitely, looking back overall, you could um, do quarterly rates for those um, sites. And if you did if you did your rolling quarters, so you didn't just wait do it in March and, and June and whatever you you actually worked out averaging um, three months, and then one month later use the last three months again, you will get more up to date information. But it is going to be a little more difficult to work with. But we've worked with a one particular clinic that was only doing, that was doing just under, between 250 and 300 cycles a year, but monthly monthly control charts still gave us a very good result uh, in terms of being able to monitor things. It's a question of how stable the lab systems are in general. So this, if the lab systems are uh, less well controlled, shall we say, then you'll have more variability from that. If you tighten up all your sources of variability, then you will decrease the variability on your KPI measures, your control charts as well. But it's part of everything else. It's, and there's another, another consensus we did in Cairo a couple of years ago with Jacques, and they're basically, the devil's in the detail. Everything's important. The more things you control, the more stable your results will become. And it makes it easier to apply these tools then. And um, this probably could about both you guys, since you guys run such uh, really good programs. Um, what's the most common mistake people make when starting a quality management program? Most common mistake. Not getting Do you want to answer that one, David? Not getting by. Do you want to, <laughs> Dr. Mortimer, you, you, you start off. Um, inadequate resources. People think it's just out, oh, just, just Put in a QMS system. It's just the lab has to do it. It's not just the lab, it's the whole clinic. So if you try and do it with the lab in isolation or everything else, you'll get some value, but the real value comes when everybody buys in and the physicians buy in. You saw that from that graph I showed. When the physicians accept that they're not perfect and that they can learn as well, you will see improvements across the board. Um, but the, the most common I mean, TQM as a total quality management, as a philosophy, does not fail. It, it's, its implementation fails, it's usually through insufficient resources. You know, and part of that resource is, is a good information system. I mean, Sharon was running a lab um, nearly 20 years ago now, and she was spending, I think, four or five days per month taking data from paper lab sheets, putting them into Excel just to work out our KPIs. That's not the best way of using your lab director. Um, there was no way of getting KPIs. So you've got to have the, the correct tools. And that's, let's say, resources, which is human and tools, are the, are the main things. Yeah, I agree 100% um, about the electronic medical records. It really opens up KPIs and regular KPI tracking as well. If you've got the data automatically in your um, electronic medical records, then you're able to access that really easily um, and quickly when you need it. Yeah, and I see a lot of people, the ranges are so wide that they'll never be out of range. and. And the idea is that it's okay to be out of range. You, you need to fall out of range every now and then so you can identify those problems as you both elegantly showed us today. We, we have the other approach, which is we want to control absolutely everything we can. And uh, in the second edition of the book, we put in a whole extra chapter on what we perceived from one of our recent uh, clients was the, uh, a well-run lab of all the things that you, you put in place, when you design the place, when you set it up, how it operates, um, that makes life a lot easier. Just, just to be proactive and uh, try and control all the variables before you, before you start. 
David, do you want to talk about how um, how your system can uh, track KPIs as well per individual for competency assessments? Because that, that was a question here. Yeah, so there, was a, uh, there was actually another um, alpha consensus that we ran in Antalya uh, somewhere about five, six years ago on the professional stage of the clinical embryologist. And that one, we were discussing how to define competency. So one of the things you can do for competency is say that when you're training someone, uh, you know, like, so say, take ICSI, you, you know, you do your initial practicing, then they start doing part cases, then they start doing whole cases under supervision. Once they start doing whole cases, so there's no risk of selection, you can actually look at what their performance rate is on the injection, uh, damage on fertilization rates, whatever. And you, if you then look at their results over, say, 10 cases, and that trainee's results, those 10 cases are within your warning limit range, they're as competent as anybody else in your lab. So you have now have a quantitative definition of competency. So you can use the same information at the individual embryologist level for training, for ongoing maintenance of competence, if you wish. Um, the issue is you, know, you need to define reference populations to make sure that you're not giving them unfair cases and stuff, uh, and that the other values are, are not brought down by having too many difficult cases. So you, you may well not use your regular KPI, you may choose to use um, a modified KPI for your reference, internal reference, where you've excluded the difficult cases. So you're going to give the trainee okay cases, so you have to have a value for okay cases, and that's the range of expected reach for competency. But it's up to you to define those things to meet your standards and your performance expectations. But you can use them not just at the lab level, you, or the clinic level, you can use the level of individuals as well. And that was um, put into that consensus document. I don't know anybody who's been doing it routinely and publishing on it. Um, and we've been looking at trying to derive ways of putting it into the, uh, the EMR as a way of being able to have that as another reporting function. Um, you know, what, you guys both discussed the, uh, the Vienna consensus today. Um, and uh, doc, I'll, I'll put this to Dr. Hammond. If uh, Dr. Mortimer wants to add to it as well, please do. Um, you know, do we? Do you believe it needs an update? And uh, how often, if you know, if it did need an update, how often would you recommend doing that? Um, so I think the Vienna Consensus is um, an excellent foundation document that has a lot of details in those uh, KPIs, a lot of background, um, and a lot of um, expert knowledge has gone into that document. Um, the one thing that we identified a gap in is just the, um, you know, the publications of those large API data sets, which um, show real world KPI tracking um, and how the data actually behaves in real life. And, you know, you've got the theory of if you're tracking this and something's off, can you fix it? that kind of thing. But um, what we're trying to do is really show that in a data um, driven way. Um, so I think there could be more work on just providing large data sets for general rates um, and also how the KPIs are behaving over time. The problem is journals aren't really interested in that sort of stuff. That's, the, that's part of the problem. <laughs> um, so having a, a, a question- We think it's interesting. We think it's interesting. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, so it may be that that might be something that uh, some national societies or uh, a society, an international scientific society could uh, have people contribute to, for example, and give you a work of a data set. Um, but I think I, I loved your paper when it came out because it meant that, apart from people paying attention to what work we put into the Vienna Consensus, it meant that um, there was a reason to hang off the data analysis off something. And I think if we, if people start thinking more about what these sorts of analyses of, of using control charts or whatever can actually help identify and can then can publish reports of how they've used these things to resolve problems, to, to monitor improvements. Uh, so rather than saying our pregnancy rate went up from this to this when we changed A to B, if they actually provide a control chart information as well, then that would actually show how the change happened and well, how yeah, you know, so a lot of things don't just go jump in one go. They they often have that gradual shift because everything has a learning curve, and whatever. 
This is why I think media trials are usually pretty pointless because there's always an adaptation phase to using a new medium. But if your trial is only three weeks, you haven't, you won't just come to grips with it when you stop the trial. So all you've got is your learning phase. So I think there's a lot of, a lot more dynamic information in the, in the studies we do that we're just not seeing, but could be brought out by control charts. So if, if um, as referees of papers, we all started saying, yeah, but I'd like to see a, a Schuhart chart of, of the period of your trial, then uh, we might start to see some more uh, um, interesting observations and, uh, and, and stop people thinking that things happen magically overnight. Do you think um, as we get new lot numbers of, of media, do you, do you suggest any special QC on it or just a closer monitoring of KPIs? But we have so many medias in the lab and, and you know, is, is, that even, is that even possible? As long as you, I, my personal opinion is that as long as you're monitoring the shipment when it arrives, you, you need log, I think you need loggers to make sure the temperature is being controlled. But the, I did a calculation for another talk recently where I looked at the magnitude of change that you would have to have in the formulation to make a measurable change in pH. And it's not possible under modern manufacturing conditions. The weather changes, and I mentioned this in a previous one of these meetings, that the, the change in atmospheric pressure with the weather change is nearly two orders of magnitude greater hmm. than what the greatest possible change you might see based on inaccurate weighing of bicarbonate, for example, and making it culture medium. Do, do but, you think that could contribute to seasonality pregnancy differences that some labs claim to see? If you, well, if you, so some of that is also temperature based. Um, I, quick anecdote, I was in one lab uh, in the south of Spain where their ICSI rig was serviced once a year in January, which was, which was winter time. Um, but in the, in the summertime, it was a very small lab, the air conditioner was above the ICSI rig and we only had one. And the uh, air conditioner was running and therefore the temperature was wrong on the ICSI rig. Uh, and the company was insistent that you only have to service it once a year, so therefore they were doing the right thing. But clearly you have to, you know, they should be doing internal measurements. You can control the, a lot of these variations internally. Is there true seasonality in reproduction? Yeah, that's very hard to come up with. And people look for seasonality in sperm production and stuff. It's not easy to see. And the human population is so variable already. I don't think we'll see much of the seasonalities in, in, in ICSI rate or uh, in ART rates. Um, but the, this, the day to day variability in many labs is, 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 is not known, never mind that well controlled. So it's a question of paying attention to all the details and minimizing all, all your variables. I, I don't think culture medium is a significant one beyond uh, failures of cold chain. Um, okay, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I'm going to ask one more question. Um, um, this is a question for you, uh, Dr. Mortimer. We talked a lot today about IVF and fertilization and blast type type work, but um, what are your thoughts on uh, quality assurance as it pertains to andrology, the endocrine testing, and you know using the Westgard rules? <laughs> yeah, I had a long discussion with young Westgard at a meeting a couple of years ago. Um, Westgard rules are great for things like manufacturing, uh, engineering, um, you can apply them to biochemistry. They don't work with biological material, with cells, living things, because the inherent variability does not allow you to apply three standard deviations to everything. The Westgard rules, you're basically expecting something that's much more controllable. So uh, I think Westgard rules in terms of, of, a, uh, of an andrology lab are, are not going to be very useful. Endocrinology, absolutely, it makes sense. For andrology, there are, you know, you have to train people. I mean, one of the fundamental problems in andrology labs is people put stuff into a lab, tell them what to do and expect they can do it. But yet there's a paper that's actually even older than I am from John McLeod that says that it's not percentage of motility that's important, it's the quality of the motility. And people have to be trained to be able to assess this. And if you don't train people how to do the assessments, they can't do them. So the WHO had this self-fulfilling prophecy. They stopped looking at grade A, grade B differentiation because you can't do it. I've been teaching to do, people to do that for more than three decades, but you have to train them. They can't do it inherently. That you can't play video games without learning a video game. And people spend many, many hours learning how to play video games 
but yet they expect staff to be able to pick up doing a, a four count with a facility count just like that. It doesn't work. So if you train people, then yes, you can apply the same classic QC principles to assessments in the Andrology lab. And it, it works. We, we, we've done that in a number of situations on big Andrology services, yes. Yeah, good point. I know that one of my biggest um, deficiencies that I oversee is the CLIA catches it all the time, um, you know, Department of Health, but, uh, and, but CAP inspectors don't always catch it as often is um, the 10% difference between your first read and your second read. Uh, uh, at least my local CLIA guy, he catches that every, you know, every two years he'll find something in there that we, I missed it. And, and so, um, you know, if you can set those parameters that are very similar to what you have in the graphs, you set the high and the low end where you can't be below 10%. There's no way to miss that. I, um, I think one of the things for, Q, for, X, for QC Andrology Labs is if you're going to use an external proficiency testing program or whatever, it must have real reference values. You can't look at something and compare it to an old laboratory's trim mean because you're, you're comparing everybody to everybody else. And of course, you're all going to have a spread around it. But they could all be way off this side of the distribution from the correct answer that's over here. So if you don't have reference values, it has no meaning as far as I'm concerned. The extra one does, for example. But when you're doing your internal assessments, when you're doing your hemocytometry, whatever, or your motility counts, you do too, and you check them. If they aren't close, you repeat it. It's, it's inherent in how you do semen analysis. And in fact, there is an ISO technical standard on basic semen analysis in preparation right now, and that is all included. But there are some areas where you don't need to do that because of the way the methods are validated. You've got to do it to five things that you do. When Rolf Menkveld developed and validated the Tigerberg strict criteria, and it was Rolf Martinez that did that, um, he said that if, the way they set it up, one slide is adequate for a clinical assessment. We're counting at least 200 preference changes per. Um, I've just got a paper that literally was just accepted uh, and is just available online as of, as of yesterday on vitality slide reading. And WHO5 says you need to read two vitality slides. The answer is, if you're doing research, you might need to, but for routine purposes to establish the vitality of non-motile sperm, one slide's enough, but 200 sperm. So if, but, these, but there's not been much published on this stuff to show where these validations have come from. So we're, we're trying to address that slowly. Um, but you know, WHO5 is full of mistakes and, and, and false assumptions. Why we don't use it. <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you. Um, the remaining of our questions are going to be answered by our presenters and we're going to post them uh, on the website. So we thank everybody for, for attending today. If anybody did again have any problems with the audio, um, the recording will be available online for any parts that you missed. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>